Hello friends, I welcome you to this installment of a calm reading of Beatrix Potter's stories. Before we begin, find yourself a place where you can relax. Get comfortable. Take a deep breath. Unwind. And let's begin these stories. The Tale of Johnny Townmouse Johnny Townmouse was born in a cupboard. Timmy Willie was born in a garden. Timmy Willie was a little country mouse who went to town by mistake in a hamper. The gardener sent vegetables to town once a week by carrier. He packed them in a big hamper. The gardener left the hamper by the garden gate, so that the carrier could pick it up when he passed. Timmy Willie crept in through a hole in the wicker work, and after eating some peas, Timmy Willie fell fast asleep. He awoke in a fright, while the hamper was being lifted into the carrier's cart. Then there was a jolting and a clattering of horses' feet. Other packages were thrown in, for miles and miles. Jolt, jolt, jolt. And Timmy Willie trembled amongst the jumbled-up vegetables. At last, the cart stopped at a house, where the hamper was taken out, carried in, and sat down. The cook gave the carrier sixpence, the back door banged, and the cart rumbled away. But there was no quiet. There seemed to be hundreds of carts passing. Dogs barked. Boys whistled in the street. The cook laughed. The parlor-maid ran up and down stairs. And the canary sang like a steam engine. Timmy Willie, who had lived all his life in a garden, was almost frightened to death. Presently the cook opened the hamper and began to unpack the vegetables. Out sprang the terrified Timmy Willie. Up jumped the cook on a chair, exclaiming, A mouse! A mouse! Call the cat! Fetch me a poker, Sarah! Timmy Willie did not wait for Sarah with the poker. He rushed along the skirting board till he came to a little hole, and in he popped. He dropped half a foot and crashed into the middle of a mouse dinner party, breaking three glasses. Who in the world is this? inquired Johnny Townmouse, but after the first exclamation of surprise, he instantly recovered his manners. With the utmost politeness, he introduced Timmy Willy to nine other mice all with long tails and white neckties. Timmy Willie's own tail was insignificant. Johnny Townmouse and his friends noticed it, but they were too well-bred to make personal remarks. Only one of them asked Timmy Willie if he had ever been in a trap. The dinner was of eight courses, not much of anything, but truly elegant. All the dishes were unknown to Timmy Willie, who would have been a little afraid of tasting them. Only he was very hungry and very anxious to behave with company manners. The continual noise upstairs made him so nervous that he dropped a plate. Never mind, they don't belong to us, said Johnny. Why don't those youngsters come back with the dessert? It should be explained that two young mice who were waiting on the others went skirmishing upstairs to the kitchen between courses. Several times they had come tumbling in, squeaking and laughing. Timmy Willie learned with horror that they were being chased by the cat. His appetite failed. He felt faint. Try some jelly, said Johnny Townmouse. No, would you rather go to bed? I will show you a most comfortable sofa pillow. The sofa pillow had a hole in it. 
Johnny Talmouse quite honestly recommended it as the best bed kept exclusively for visitors. But the sofa smelt of cat. Timmy Willy preferred to spend a miserable night under the fender. It was the same next day. An excellent breakfast was provided for mice accustomed to eat bacon. But Timmy Willy had been reared on roots and salad. Johnny Townmouse and his friends racketed about under the floors and came boldly out all over the house in the evening. One particularly loud crash had been caused by Sarah tumbling downstairs with the tea tray. There were crumbs and sugar and smears of jam to be collected in spite of the cat. Timmy Willy longed to be home in his peaceful nest in a sunny bank. The food disagreed with him. The noise prevented him from sleeping. In a few days he grew so thin that Johnny Talmos noticed it and questioned him. He listened to Timmy Willie's story and inquired about the garden. It sounds rather a dull place. What do you do when it rains? When it rains, I sit in my little sandy burrow and shell corn and seeds from my autumn store. I peep out at the throstles and blackbirds on the lawn and my friend, Cock Robin. And when the sun comes out again, you should see my garden and the flowers, roses and pinks and pansies, no noise except the birds and bees, and the lambs in the meadows. There goes that cat again, exclaimed Johnny Tunmouse. When they had taken refuge in the coal cellar, he resumed the conversation. I confess I am a little disappointed. We have endeavoured to entertain you, Timothy William. Oh, yes, yes, you have been most kind. But I do feel so ill, said Timmy Willie. It may be that your teeth and digestion are unaccustomed to our food. Perhaps it might be wiser for you to return in the hamper. Oh, oh, cried Timmy Willie. Why, of course. For the matter of that, we could have sent you back last week, said Johnny rather huffily. Did you not know that the hamper goes back empty on Saturdays? So Timmy Willie said goodbye to his new friends, and hid in the hamper with a crumb of cake and a withered cabbage leaf, and after much jolting he was set down safely in his own garden. Sometimes on Saturdays he went to look at the hamper lying by the gate, but he knew better than to get in again, and nobody got out, though Johnny Townmouse had half promised a visit. The winter passed. The sun came out again. Timmy Willie sat by his burrow, warming his little fur coat and sniffing the smell of violets and spring grass. He had nearly forgotten his visit to town, when up the sandy path, all spick and span with a brown leather bag, came Johnny Townwells. Timmy Willie received him with open arms. You have come at the best of all the year. We will have herb pudding and sit in the sun. Mmm, it is a little damp, said Johnny Townwells, who was carrying his tail under his arm out of the mud. What is that fearful noise? He started violently. That, said Timmy Willie, that is only a cow. I will beg a little milk. They are quite harmless, unless they happen to lie down upon you. How are all our friends? Johnny's account was rather middling. He explained why he was paying his visit so early in the season. The family had gone to the seaside for Easter. The cook was doing spring cleaning on board wages, with particular instructions to clear out the mice. There were four kittens, and the cat had killed the canary. They say we did it, but I know better, said Johnny Talmouse. Whatever is that fearful racket? That is only the lawnmower. I will fetch some of the grass clippings presently to make your bed. I am sure 
you had better settle in the country, Johnny. Hmm, we shall see by Tuesday week. The hamper is stopped while they are at the seaside. I am sure you will never want to live in town again, said Timmy Billy. But he did. He went back the very next hamper of vegetables. He said it was too quiet. One place suits one person. Another place suits another person. For my part, I prefer to live in the country. Like Timmy Willie. The Tale of Two Bad Mice Once upon a time, there was a very beautiful doll's house. It was red brick with white windows, and it had real muslin curtains and a front door and a chimney. It belonged to two dolls, called Lucinda and Jane. At least it belonged to Lucinda, but she never ordered meals. Jane was the cook, but she never did any cooking, because the dinner had been bought ready-made in a box full of shavings. There were two red lobsters, and a ham, a fish, a pudding, and some pears and oranges. They would not come off the plates, but they were extremely beautiful. One morning, Lucinda and Jane had gone out for a drive in the doll's perambulator. There was no one in the nursery, and it was very quiet. Presently there was a little scuffling, scratching noise in a corner near the fireplace, where there was a hole under the skirting board. Tom Thumb put out his head for a moment, and then popped it in again. Tom Thumb was a mouse. A minute afterwards, Hunka Munka, his wife, put her head out too, and when she saw that there was no one in the nursery, she ventured out on the oilcloth under the coal box. The doll's house stood at the other side of the fireplace. Tom Thumb and Hunka Munka went cautiously across the hearth rug. They pushed the front door. It was not fast. Tom Thumb and Hunka Munka went upstairs and peeped into the dining room. Then they squeaked with joy. Such a lovely dinner was laid out upon the table. There were tin spoons and lead knives and forks and two dolly chairs, all so convenient. Tom Thumb set to work at once to carve the ham. It was a beautiful shiny yellow streaked with red. The knife crumpled up and hurt him. He put his finger in his mouth. It is not boiled enough. It is hard. You have a try, Hunkamonka. Hunkamonka stood up in her chair and chopped at the ham with another lead knife. It is hard as the hams at the cheesemongers, said Hunkamonka. The ham broke off the plate with a jerk, and rolled under the table. Let it alone, said Tom Thumb. Give me some fish, Hunka Munka. Hunka Munka tried every tin spoon in turn. The fish was glued to the dish. Then Tom Thumb lost his temper. He put the ham in the middle of the floor, and hid it with the thongs and with the shovel. Bang, bang, smash, smash. The ham flew all into pieces, for underneath the shiny paint it was made of nothing but plaster. Then there was no end to the rage and disappointment of Tom Thumb and Hunka Munka. They broke up the pudding, the lobster, the pears and the oranges. As the fish would not come off the plate, they put it into the red-hot, crinkly paper fire in the kitchen, but it would not burn either. Tom Thumb went up the kitchen chimney and looked out at the top. There was no soot. While Tom Thumb was up the chimney, Hunka Munka had another disappointment. 
she found some tiny canisters upon the dresser, labeled rice, coffee, sago. But when she turned them upside down, there was nothing inside except red and blue beets. Then those mice set to work to do all the mischief they could, especially Tom Thumb. He took Jane's clothes out of the chest of drawers in her bedroom, and he threw them out of the top floor window. But Hunka Monka had a frugal mind. After pulling half the feathers out of Lucinda's bolster, she remembered that she herself was in want of a feather bed. With Tom Thumb's assistance, she carried the bolster downstairs, and across the hearth rug. It was difficult to squeeze the bolster into the mouse hole, but they managed it somehow. Then Hunka Monka went back and fetched a chair, a bookcase, a bird cage, and several small odds and ends. The bookcase and the bird cage refused to go into the mouse hole. Hunka Monka left them behind the coal box and went to fetch a cradle. Hunka Monka was just returning with another chair, when suddenly there was a noise of talking outside upon the landing. The mice rushed back to the hall, and the dolls came into the nursery. What a sight met the eyes of Jane and Lucinda. Lucinda sat upon the upset kitchen stove and stared. And Jane leaned against the kitchen dresser and smiled but neither of them made any remark. The bookcase and the birdcage were rescued from under the coal box, but Hunka Monka has got the cradle and some of Lucinda's clothes. She also has some useful pots and pans and several other things. The little girl that the doll's house belonged to said, I will get a doll dressed like a policeman. But the nurse said, I will set a mouse trap. So, that is the story of the two bad mice. But they were not so very naughty after all, because Tom Thumb paid for everything he broke. He found a crooked sixpence under the hearth rug, and upon Christmas Eve, he and Hunka Monka stuffed it into one of the stockings of Lucinda and Jane. And very early every morning, before anybody is awake, Hunka Monka comes with a dustpan and a broom to sweep the doll's house. The Story of Miss Muppet this is a pussy, called Miss Muppet. She thinks she has heard a mouse. This is the mouse peeping out behind the cupboard and making fun of Miss Muppet. He is not afraid of a kitten. This is Miss Muppet jumping just too late. She missed the mouse and hit her own head. She thinks it is a very hard cupboard. The mouse watches Miss Muppet from the top of the cupboard. Miss Muppet ties up her head in a duster and sits before the fire. The mouse thinks she is looking very ill. He comes sliding down the bell pole. Miss Muppet looks worse and worse. The mouse comes a little nearer. Miss Muppet holds her poor head in her paws and looks at him through a hole in the duster. The mouse comes very close, and then all of a sudden Miss Muppet jumps upon the mouse. And because the mouse has teased Miss Muppet, Miss Muppet thinks she will tease the mouse, which is not at all nice of Miss Muppet. She ties him up in the duster and tosses it about like a ball, 
but she forgot about the hole in the duster. And when she untied it, there was no mouse. He has wriggled out and run away, and he is dancing a jig on the top of the cupboard. The Tailor of Gloucester In the time of swords and periwigs and full-skirted coats with flowered lappets, when gentlemen wore ruffles and gold-laced waistcoats of paduasoy and taffeta. There lived a tailor in Gloucester. He sat in the window of a little shop in Westgate Street, cross-legged on a table from morning till dark. All day long, while the light lasted, he sewed and snippeted it, piecing out his satin and pompadour, and lustering. Stuffs had strange names and were very expensive in the days of the tailor of Gloucester. But although he sewed fine silk for his neighbors, he himself was very, very poor. A little old man in spectacles, with a pinched face, old crooked fingers, and a suit of threadbare clothes. He cut his coats without waist, according to his embroidered cloth. They were very small ends and snippets that lay about upon the table. Two narrow breadths for naught, except waistcoats for mice, said the tailor. One bitter cold day, near Christmas time, the tailor began to make a coat. A coat of cherry-colored corded silk, embroidered with pansies and roses, and a cream-colored satin waistcoat, trimmed with gauze and green worsted chenille, for the mayor of Gloucester. The tailor worked and worked, and he talked to himself. He measured the silk and turned it round and round, and trimmed it into shape with his shears. The table was all littered with cherry-colored snippets. No breadth at all, and cut on the cross. It is no breadth at all. Tippets for mice and ribbons for mobs. For mice, said the tailor of Gloucester when the snowflakes came down against the small leaded window panes and shut out the light. The tailor had done his day's work. All the silk and satin lay cut out upon the table. There were twelve pieces for the coat and four pieces for the waistcoat, and there were pocket flaps and cuffs and buttons all in order. For the lining of the coat, there was fine yellow taffeta, and for the buttonholes of the waistcoat there was cherry-colored twist. And everything was ready to sew together in the morning, all measured and sufficient. Except that there was wanting just one single skein of cherry-colored twisted silk. The tailor came out of his shop at dark for he did not sleep there at nights. He fastened the window and locked the door, and took away the key. No one lived there at night but little brown mice, and they run in and out without any keys. For behind the wooden wainscots of all the old houses in Gloucester, there are little mouse staircases and secret trapdoors, and the mice run from house to house through those long, narrow passages. They can run all over the town without going into the street. But the tailor came out of his shop and shuffled home through the snow. He lived quite nearby in College Court, next the doorway to College Green. And although it was not a big house, the tailor was so poor he only rented the kitchen. He lived alone with his cat. It was called Simkin. Now, all day long while the tailor was out at work, Simkin 
kept house by himself. And he also was fond of the mice, though he gave them no satin for coats. Meow, said the cat when the tailor opened the door. Meow. The tailor replied, Simkin, we shall make our fortune, but I am worn to a reveling. Take this groat, which is our last fourpence, and Simkin, take a china pipkin, buy a penneth of bread, a penneth of milk, and a penneth of sausages. And oh, Simkin, with the last penny of our fourpence, buy me one penneth of cherry-colored silk. But do not lose the last penny of the fourpence, Simkin, or I am undone and worn to a thread paper, for I have no more twist. Then Simkin again said, Meow, and took the groat and pipkin, and went out into the dark. The tailor was very tired and beginning to be ill. He sat down by the hearth and talked to himself about the wonderful colt. I shall make my fortune to be cut by us. The mayor of Gloucester is to be married on Christmas Day in the morning, and he hath ordered a coat and an embroidered waistcoat to be lined with yellow taffeta, and the taffeta sufficeth. There is no more left over in snippets than will serve to make tippets for mice. Then the tailor started, for suddenly interrupting him from the dresser at the other side of the kitchen came a number of little noises. Tip-tap, tip-tap, tip-tap-tip. Now what can that be? said the tailor of Gloucester, jumping up from his chair. The dresser was covered with crockery and pipkins, willow pattern plates, and teacups and mugs. The tailor crossed the kitchen and stood quite still beside the dresser, listening and peering through his spectacles. Again from under the teacup came those funny little noises. Tip-tap, tip-tap, tip-tap-tip. This is very peculiar, said the tailor of Gloucester, and he lifted up the teacup, which was upside down. Out stepped a little live lady mouse, and made a curtsy to the tailor. Then she hopped away down off the dresser, and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down again by the fire, warming his poor cold hands, and mumbling to himself. The waistcoat is cut out from peach-colored satin, timber stitch and rose buds in beautiful floss silk. Was I wise to entrust my last fourpence to Simkin, one and twenty buttonholes of cherry-colored twist? But all at once, from the dresser, there came other little noises. Tip-tap, tip-tap, tip-tap-tip. This is passing extraordinary, said the tailor of Gloucester, and turned over another teacup, which was upside down. Out stepped a little gentleman mouse, and made a bow to the tailor. And then from all over the dresser came a chorus of little tappings, all sounding together, and answering one another like watch beetles in an old worm-eaten window shutter. Tip-tap, tip-tap, tip-tap-tip. And out from under teacups and from under bowls and basins stepped other and more little mice who hopped away down off the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down, close over the fire, lamenting, one and twenty buttonholes of cherry-colored silk, to be finished by noon of Saturday, and this is Tuesday evening, was I right to let loose those mice, undoubtedly the property of Simkin. Alack, I am undone, for I have no more twist. 
The little mice came out again, and listened to the tailor. They took notice of the pattern of that wonderful coat. They whispered to one another about the taffeta lining, and about little mouse tippets. And then, all at once, they all ran away together, down the passage behind the wainscot, squeaking and calling to one another as they ran from house to house and not one mouse was left in the tailor's kitchen. When Simkin came back with the pipkin of milk, Simkin opened the door and bounced in with an angry grrr meow, like a cat that is vexed, for he hated the snow, and there was snow in his ears, and snow in his collar at the back of his neck. He put down the loaf and the sausages upon the dresser and sniffed. Simkin, said the tailor, where is my twist? But Simkin set down the pipkin of milk upon the dresser and looked suspiciously at the teacups. He wanted his supper of little fat mouse. Simkin, said the tailor, where is my twist? But Simkin hid a little parcel privately in the teapot, and spit and growled at the tailor. And if Simkin had been able to talk, he would have asked, Where is my mouse? Alack, I am undone, said the tailor of Cluster, and went sadly to bed. All that night long, Simkin hunted and searched through the kitchen peeping into cupboards and under the wainscot, and into the teapot where he had hidden that twist. But still he found never a mouse. Whenever the tailor muttered and talked in his sleep, Simkin said, Meow, girl, and made strange horrid noises as cats do at night for the poor old tailor was very ill with a fever, tossing and turning in his four-post bed, and still in his dreams he mumbled, No more twist, no more twist. All that day he was ill, and the next day, and the next. And what should become of the cherry-colored coat in the tailor shop in Westgate Street the embroidered silk and satin lay cut upon the table. One and twenty buttonholes, and who should come to sew them when the window was barred and the door was fast locked? But that does not hinder the little brown mice. They run in and out without any keys through all the old houses in Gloucester. Out of doors the market folks went trudging through the snow to buy their geese and turkeys and to bake their Christmas pies. But there would be no Christmas dinner for Simkin and the poor old tailor of Gloucester. The tailor lay ill for three days and nights. And then it was Christmas Eve, and very late at night, the moon climbed up over the roofs and chimneys, and looked down over the gateway into College Court. There were no lights in the windows, nor any sound in the houses. All the city of Gloucester was fast asleep under the snow. And still, Simkin wanted his mice, and he mewed as he stood beside the four-post bed. But it is in the old story that all the beasts can talk, in the night between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in the morning, though there are very few folk that can hear them, or know what it is that they say. When the cathedral clock struck twelve, there was an answer, like an echo of the chimes, and Simkin heard it, and came out of the tailor's door, and wandered about in the snow. From all the roofs and gables and old wooden houses in Gloucester came a thousand merry voices, singing the old Christmas rhymes. 
all the old songs that ever I heard of, and some that I don't know, like Whittington's bells. First and loudest the clocks cried out, Dame, get up and bake your pies. Oh, dilly, 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 sighed Simkin. And now in a garret there were lights and sounds of dancing, and cats came from over the way. Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, all the cats in Gloucester, except me, said Simkin. Under the wooden eaves the starlings and sparrows sang of Christmas pies. The jackdaws woke up in the cathedral tower, and although it was the middle of the night, the throstles and robins sang. The air was quite full of little twittering tunes. But it was all rather provoking to poor hungry Simkin. Particularly he was vexed with some little shrill voices from behind a wooden lattice. I think that they were bats, because they always have very small voices, especially in a black frost, when they talk in their sleep, like the tailor of Gloucester. They said something mysterious that sounded like, Buzz, quoth the blue fly, hum, quoth the bee, buzz and hum they cry, and so do we and Simkin went away shaking his ears, as if he had a bee in his bonnet. From the tailor's shop in Westgate came a glow of light, and when Simkin crept up to peep in at the window, it was full of candles. There was a snippeting of scissors and snappeting of thread, and little mouse voices sang loudly and gaily. Four and twenty tailors went to catch a snail, the best man amongst them durst not touch her tail. She put out her horns, like a little Kylo cow. Run, tailors, run, or she'll have you all in now. Then, without a pause, the little mouse voices went on again. Sieve my lady's oatmeal, grind my lady's flour. Put it in a chestnut, let it stand an hour. Meow, meow, interrupted Simkin, and he scratched at the door. But the key was under the tailor's pillow. He could not get in. The little mice only laughed and tried another tune. Three little mice sat down to spin. Pussy passed by and she peeped in. What are you at, my fine little men, making coats for gentlemen? Shall I come in and cut off your threads? Oh, no, Miss Pussy, you'd bite off our heads. Meow, meow, cried Simkin. Hey, diddle ding catty, answered the little mice. Hey, diddle ding catty, poppity pet. The merchants of London, they were scarlet. Silk in the collar and gold in the hem. So merrily marched the merchant men. They clicked their thimbles to mark the time but none of the songs pleased Simkin. He sniffed and mewed at the door of the shop. And then I bought a pipkin and a popkin, a slipkin and a slopkin, all for one farthing. And upon the kitchen dresser added the rude little mice. Meow, scratch, scratch, scuffled Simkin on the window sill while the little mice inside sprang to their feet and all began to shout at once in little twittering voices, No more twist! No more twist! And they barred up the window shutters and shut out Simkin. But still, through the nicks in the shutters, he could hear the click of thimbles and little mouse voices singing, No more twist! No more twist! Simkin came away from the shop and went home, considering in his mind. He found the poor old tailor without fever, sleeping peacefully. Then Simkin went on tiptoe and took a little parcel of silk out of the teapot and looked at it in the moonlight. 
and he felt quite ashamed of his badness compared with those good little mice. When the tailor awoke in the morning, the first thing which he saw upon the patchwork quilt was a skein of cherry-colored twisted silk. And beside his bed stood the repentant Simkin. Alack, I am worn to a reveling, said the tailor of Gloucester. But I have my twist. The sun was shining on the snow when the tailor got up and dressed and came out into the street with Simkin running before him. The starlings whistled on the chimney stacks, and the throstles and robins sang, but they sang their own little noises, not the words they had sung in the night. Alack, said the tailor, I have my twist, but no more strength, nor time, and then will serve to make me one single buttonhole, for it is Christmas day in the morning. The mayor of Gloucester shall be married by noon. And where is his cherry-colored coat? He unlocked the door of the little shop in Westgate Street, and Simkin ran in, like a cat that expects something. But there was no one there, not even one little brown mouse. The boards were swept clean, the little ends of thread and the little silk snippets were all tidied away and gone from off the floor. But upon the table, oh joy, the tailor gave a shout, there where he had left plain cuttings of silk. There lay the most beautifulest coat and embroidered satin waistcoat that ever were worn by a mayor of Gloucester. There were roses and pansies upon the facings of the coat, and the waistcoat was worked with poppies and cornflowers. Everything was finished except one single cherry-colored buttonhole, and where that buttonhole was wanting, there was pinned a scrap of paper with these words, in little teeny-weeny writing. No more twist. And from then began the luck of the tailor of Gloucester. He grew quite stout, and grew quite rich. He made the most wonderful waistcoats for all the rich merchants of Gloucester, and for all the fine gentlemen of the country round. Never were seen such ruffles or such embroidered cuffs and lappets, but his buttonholes were the greatest triumph of it all. The stitches of those buttonholes were so neat, so neat, I wonder how they could be stitched by an old man in spectacles, with crooked old fingers and a tailor's thimble. The stitches of those buttonholes were so small, so small, they looked as if they had been made by little mice. <laughs>